Good morning, everyone. Uh, so th this morning, I uh, would like us to do something which is a uh, uh, thematic but brief before we get back to discussion of uh, some of the past questions uh, as part of the random uh, discussions that we've been having. I have hinted you before that currently there is a, a project uh, going on before the Law Reform Commission of Ghana. And that project aims to uh, make recommendation for enactment of unfair contract terms legislation. So uh, they've sent document around trying to solicit uh, views. Uh, so I would like us to uh, briefly discuss exclusion, exemption clause, and then when we finish, we quickly look at the, 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 some of the things that the Law Reform Commission is talking about. Now, we are doing this against the fact that if uh, whoever is your examiner this year aware of the development at the Law Reform Commission, I think it's a, a good thing to invite students to uh, share their thoughts regarding the trajectory or the path along which they think that uh, if the lawmaker would like to legislate on this area of contract law, it should do. Of course, we are very much aware of the, in some uh, jurisdictions like the UK, they have a terms act and all that for so many years. Let us quickly uh, revise on the common law and then having revised on the common law, we will uh, look at the, the the raw document by the Law Reform Commission in order to uh, you know stimulate some uh, thoughts around the subject. Yeah, so let me stop and share my screen again. Okay, so we will spend some 30, 40 minutes trying to quickly do this. So we would like to discuss exclusion, exemption, uh, clauses. So uh, you have a contract. The contract, as we know, is supposed to set out the terms of the contract. That is fine. But it, there is a practice in which one of the parties to the contract may uh, want a particular uh, clause to be put in the contract, which seeks to uh, either completely limit person's liability, should there be a breach on his part, or to say that in the event of a breach, you cannot uh, hold me liable beyond this particular uh, quantum of damages, as it were. So where it is like a, a total exclusion saying that you not be held liable at all, then we call that the uh, what they call the exemption clause or exclusion clause. But where you are not seeking to say that I cannot be held liable at all, but you're only trying to place a cap on how much liable. They recall that the 
uh, limitation uh, clause. Now, uh, this clause, be it exemption or limitation clauses, are, are obviously uh, problematic and they suggest some unfairness as far as contracting is concerned. And for that matter, the common law sets a very stringent test which must be met before it will be considered valid. So therefore, as far as the common law is concerned, before exclusion or exemption clause can be considered valid, first and foremost, there must be evidence that it was incorporated into the contract. Being incorporated into the contract means that it actually formed part of the contract and it was not just outside the contract. And secondly, uh, even if it is demonstrated that it formed part of the contract as, as, as to the, uh, the requirement of, let's say, incorporation. The, the second requirement is that the wording of the exemption clause must cover exactly uh, what happened. In other words, when a breach has occurred, uh, the exemption clause that was demonstrated was actually made part of the contract should be uh, interpreted to cover the exact breach which has occurred, for which reason you are trying to either exclude liability or you are trying to place a uh, limitation on your liability. So that is how the common law tries to control the use of exemption clause so that its uh, you know, effect as far as unfairness in the contracting uh, enterprise is concerned will be curtailed or minimized as it were. So we will quickly look at uh, this uh, requirement one after the other. Now, how do we prove that exemption clause or limitation clause has been incorporated into the contracts? Uh, well, to prove that it's been incorporated into the contract, I have uh, indicated uh, if it's been incorporated is to start with is not binding because it doesn't form part of it. And for that matter, uh, it should not be introduced after the contract. It should be introduced either at the time or before the contract. And that was why the well-known case of Chapelty and Barry UDC that you know is quite instructive where the, 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 the guy got the deck uh, chair and, and the chairs were actually run by the local council. Now, having uh, obtained the chair, he was given a ticket, and the ticket in front said that see back. You look at the back, and the council was saying that the council was not prepared to accept any liability for any injury that arise from the use of the chair. Uh, this gentleman uh, sat on the chair and eventually uh, got injured as a result of the collapse of the chair. So he sought to sue the council, and the council to place reliance on the exemption clause. So what the court needed to do was to find out whether the requirement of incorporation had been met. And the court said that uh, having regard to the circumstances, could it be said that where the exemption clause was, that is at the back of the ticket, could a reasonable person have known that it was meant to be part of the contract? And the court said that certainly no, because a ticket uh, which is just like a receipt, it's a historical document, historical in the sense that a transaction takes place and then after you give the other party something to look at. So it is not expected that what is written on that transactional document, that is a receipt or the, or the ticket, was meant to form part of the contract, which has already taken place. So the court uh, made the point that it was not incorporated. So therefore, how do we prove the incorporation? We can prove that the exemption clause has been incorporated uh, in one of, let's say, uh, three ways, either by signature or by notice or by course of dealing. That is how we prove that it's been uh, incorporated. So as far as signature is concerned, we will not waste time. The position of the law is quite clear that where you put your signature on something, then uh, implication or assumption is that you have accepted to be bound by what you put your signature on. So that is the general principle of law. So, but the only uh, caveat is that there's no uh, fraud, right? So that if there is fraud, 
if you signed as a result of fraud or as a result of any of the vitiating factors that we know, the uh, rest uh, on new funds and so on, then that is going to be uh, problematic. But in absence of fraud and you signing it generally, your signature on the document means that you have accepted to be bound uh, by it. And we know there have uh, many authorities in that respect, uh, Lestrange and Graco and Wilson and Broby, so many, so many authorities. So we will not waste time on that. It doesn't matter that you did not uh, read the, the document. If you did not read it, you are still bound by it. But again, as I indicated, if you sign as a result of uh, some deception, fraud or misrepresentation, then you are not bound by it as happened in the Curtis and Chemical Cleaning Limited. And you remember that in that case, the woman having given the wedding gown was given uh, by the lender attendant, was given a document by the lender attendant to sign. And she inquired, uh, what was it that she was signing? And the, the laundry attendant told her that the laundry company was saying that should anything uh, happen to the beast and the sequin, which had been used to decorate the gun, they were not prepared to accept liability. So basis of that, the woman signed. Later on, uh, when she came back with the gun, it was seriously mutilated, destroyed. And the uh, company, when she sought to place reliance on the document that the woman signed, uh, that is exemption clause. And, and then the court said that the woman had been deceived into something, uh, having a bigger scope than what he was made to believe he was, she was signing. What the company was really saying was that it was not prepared to accept any liability at all, not only just destruction to the beast and the sequin. So therefore, uh, there has been some uh, fraudulent misrepresentation uh, on the part of the, you know, the, the laundry. And that was why the court created it. Now, despite the fact that the woman had put her signature on the exemption clause, she was not bound by it. I mean, the same thing uh, as you the same thing as saying the uh, non s factum, non s factum that uh, this is not my deed or a document that I, I signed uh, is fundamentally different or radically different from what I intended to sign. And if my signature is here at all, that is not what I intend. And so non uh, s factum as uh, it were, this is not uh, my deed. So all those things are uh, uh, permissible. As long as you had not signed as uh, a free uh, person of your own mind, as it were. But I've indicated that if you don't read, that is no defense, right? If you don't read, that is no defense. And again, and this is where the law reform project also will become relevant. Uh, if you take, uh, let's say, illiterate, right? You take illiterate, someone uh, who cannot. Uh, uh, read and, and write, uh, is he or she bound by uh, exemption clause that uh, he or she is supposed to have appended uh, his or her uh, thumbprint? The answer uh, is that there must be a jurat. There must be uh, no evidence that before the person thumbprinted or signed, he or she uh, was made to understand or she appeared to have understood what he or she was saying and having her saying uh, read and interpreted to him in the language that uh, he or she uh, understands. So that is uh, very important. But again, it, where you are, you are negligent, you know you, you need spectacles to read. You don't have the spectacles and then you just go ahead and sign without knowing exactly what you are signing. Now, you will not be allowed to plead non s factum, right? So as uh, we know, like in the cases like the Sounders Again Angular Building Society, uh, in Chroma and Sewai and all that. So let's keep all those things in mind. And as I told you, these things, you are supposed to know them. That's why I'm just uh, uh, rattling or just rushing through them. Good. So we have seen how 
exemption or exclusion clause may be incorporated by signature. Now let us look at the other uh, scenario that is where signature is not required. Yes, the exemption clause is in writing, but there's no requirement for signing anything. On that basis, how could a be bound by the exemption clause? Well, where the exemption clause is not a signed document, a document requiring signature, the position of the law uh, is that uh, it must, uh, uh, no reasonable and sufficient notice of the it must have been given to the other party. So you must have given reasonable and sufficient notice to the other party that that exemption clause exists before he or she will be bound by that uh, exemption clause. Well, let's uh, keep that in mind. And you remember very well the case of the Parker and Southeastern Railway. Somebody deposited a bag in the cloakroom of the other train station, giving a receipt, and then in the front of it, it was stated C back. And then on his back, it was stated that the company uh, was excluded from liability for items with 10 pounds or more. In other words, if you put something there and it got lost and all that, and if the value exceeds 10 pounds, company was not going to pay more than that. It will pay maximum of uh, just 10 and no more. Now, uh, Mr. Parker did not read clause when he was giving the ticket because he was thinking that there's a receipt for payment that he had made. So it was not something to read him. During the trial, in Mr. Parker admitted that uh, he was very much aware that the ticket contained writing, despite the fact that uh, he did not uh, read it. So when his bag got lost and he was making the claim, the company relied on the, on the writing. And the question uh, of law to the court was whether the clause was applicable to Mr. Parker. Could the company uh, you know, seek refuge under the clause. So that was a the matter. And the Court of Appeal, by its majority came, of course, they ordered a retrial and formulated certain questions that if Mr. Parker knew of the conditions, uh, then he'll be bound. But if he did not know, he was still bound if he was given the ticket in such a way as amounted to reasonable uh, notice. In other words, the court was saying that since the ticket did not require signature and all that, what really mattered was that did the other party know or was reasonable notice given to the other party that that exemption clause existed and that it formed part of the contract. If the answer is yes, then he is bound by uh, the exemption clause and the, uh, the railway company could actually place reliance uh, on it as uh, it were. And of course, vice versa, if he did not know Miller said, then uh, he would not be bound. Or if it was given in circumstances uh, which reasonably did not suggest that it contain uh, you no know, exemption clause it contain, or contain some conditions of the contract, then that will not be uh, binding. But let's uh, remember that the emphasis is not so much about actual notice. The emphasis is about reasonable notice. So when we say like the reasonable notice, in other words, we are thinking about like the, the of course, the, the Objective test again, the reasonable uh, man, right? Would a reasonable person, for example, have considered that a particular uh, clause or a particular statement was meant to form part of the contract which has been made? Excuse me. If the answer is yes, then it is part of the, of, of, of the contract. And if the answer is no, then it's not part. 
So you remember the, what you call it, the ticket uh, cases. We go to the railway company and all that. Like, for example, in Thompson and against the London Midland, there's called railway. You go to the railway uh, station and then the, the, you get a ticket and there's indication on it that conditions of the contract, that is the condi conditions under which the rail company has agreed to on this train uh, have been uh, stated. I don't a timetable or you can get a copy of it from the station master's uh, office. And then you have to pay, let's say, a token to get uh, that. And the court also reviewed that, yes, that could still uh, be treated as a reasonable uh, notice. Uh, and for that matter, you couldn't say that uh, you're not aware or you could not have made aware if you wanted to be made aware of the existence of that uh, particular uh, clause. And again, uh, as whether the person is literate, you know, or I mean illiterate, that is beside the point. That is uh, beside beside the point. And if we read the opinion of the court, uh, what is important is uh, reasonable notice. So the question is, uh, where there's no need for signature or tamperant, and the exclusion clause or the limitation clause is boldly drawing attention and all that. But we have, let's say, people who cannot read. Are they too bound by it? The authorities seem to suggest that, yes, uh, you're bound by it. And if, of course, if you look at the English authority, they say that uh, illiteracy is not privilege, isn't it? But can we say the same thing in our uh, jurisdiction? Especially having regard to uh, the previous council decision in the uh, Kwame and Kofo, and then the Illiterate Protection Ordinance, as uh, it were. Mm. But the other point to note is that the law requires, like, well, I mentioned the, the Illiterate, and then there's this the old case of uh, Gia and uh, Kuja. Uh, the notice was in English, but the it was pasted on the windscreen of the car, saying that passenger who traveled traveled at their own risk, and this particular passenger was a, a German who did not speak English at all, and the court took the view that well having regard to the unique circumstances of this particular case, uh, the German passenger was not bound by the clause because reasonable care had not been taken to bring it to uh, his attention. But one thing to note is that the law requires that attention must be drawn to any unusual clause. Any unusual clause uh, means, and this is another area where the Ghana Law Reform uh, Commission project is also relevant. Unusual clause means that uh, things which are not expected to be made subject matter of um, exemption clause. And what uh, do we mean by that? For example, uh, in uh, taunting against a shoe uh, lane parking, it was stated that a person who drives his car into a car park might expect to find in his contract a clause excluding liability for loss or damage, right, to the, uh, the car or items in the car as it were, that is to property. But you don't expect to get a notice saying that uh, the owner of the premises is, for example, excluding liability for personal injury. I mean, that is not usual. Yes, we can expect that you go to car park, right? You, you, you park various places. You see some form of like a, a, a notice, some form of like exemption clause that we don't accept any damage or any uh, loss of item, valuable items and all that, that is fine. But it is quite strange for you to go to 
a car park or a premises and you are greeted with a notice that uh, they exclude liability for personal injury that may happen to you. That is quite unusual. And because it's unusual, the, the requirement set by the law is quite high. It's more stringent. So you need to do more, right? You need to do more to draw attention to existence of unusual clause as forming part of the, uh, the contract. So that is the point. So the more unusual the clause, which is the subject matter of the exemption or the exclusion or limitation clauses, uh, the greater the burden for you to draw attention the other a party to us it were. So let's keep that in mind. And that was why in the case of uh, inter photo picture library against the Saleto visual programs, the English Court of Appeal confirmed that onerous condition required special measures to bring them to the attention of the defendant. Yeah, so if you look at that case, for example, there was a clause uh, imposed you no know, charges of 10 times higher than the normal uh, charges as is usually done in that type of contract. And the court of appeal said, if you have a more unusual clause, then uh, greater notice of it is required so that the other party against whom is going to operate will have no doubt in his mind uh, or her mind uh, regarding uh, that particular exemption clause. So that's what we should uh, keep in mind. Yeah, we've talked about the fact that the exem where the, you know, the exemption clause does not require signature, we've said that it's not just a question of giving actual notice. You must give a reasonable notice. And where the, it's even unusual, then you have to give him like a, a more uh, greater notice, that is fine. Then we are also making the point that the notice of the exemption clause not requiring signature uh, must be given contemporaneous with the contract. It, you know, it must be given either before or at the time that the contract is being made. Then you know the old case of uh, Ole and uh, Marlboro, the couple that went to the hotel. And then when they went to the hotel, uh, as you remember, uh, having been given their room and all that, uh, they left some of their staff there and went out later when they came back. Another staff having the key had gone in to do certain things and they sought to sue the, the, the management. But the company sought to play reliance on the fact that they had writing on the wall in the room saying that management did not accept liability for any uh, loss or damage uh, that may occur. So fundamental question before the court was whether the writing uh, in the hotel room formed part of the contract which the lodgers had made with the hotel. So the court decided to find out at what point was the contract made. And the conclusion was that the contract was made at the, if you like, the reception uh, point where they you know, express in the room and then the hotel also decided to give a room to them. And if that uh, contract was supposed to include anything to the effect that handover valuables, otherwise should anything happen, the company is not going to uh, be held liable. That ought to have been uh, stated at that stage or ought to have been made known at that stage and not uh, in the room. Because by the time you get to the room, a contract is already in existence. So the notice of that exemption clause was not contemporary with the contract. It really came after. And because it came after, it doesn't really satisfy the requirement. So uh, you remember only a marble and all that. And that applies to uh, so many uh, instances of uh, taking receipt cases. And finally, exemption clause, exclusion clause, limitation clause may be incorporated by uh, course of dealing. 
cause of dealing, when we say like the cause of dealing, that is to say that having regard to the two parties, they are not dealing with one another just for the first time. There has been uh, some uh, cause of dealing between them uh, in the past. There will be some uh, cause of dealing between them in the past. And because of that, the law says that we can uh, assume that based upon the established cause of dealing between them, uh, no specific uh, efforts need to be made to bring the existence of the exemption clause to the attention of the party. Because even like the LSA previously, uh, the same thing might have been uh, passed with transaction that they did and so on. Yeah, so uh, the authority, remember like the spelling and the Bradshaw illustrating the fact that uh, where that in the course of dealing, then on basis of that, we could say that exemption clause has been completed. But more importantly, the course of dealing should not be a one-off. When we say one-off, it should not be the case that uh, maybe last two weeks dealt with the person. And for that matter, we can assume that there's a, a course of dealing. No, the course of dealing must be consistent. There should be like a, some a pattern. We can say that there's been like a number of times I have dealt uh, At all those times, the same pattern uh, is, is, is followed and not just uh, one of, so uh, McToon against uh, David uh, McBrain uh, Limited and all that. And where it is, uh, you know, you, you are trying to you know, use it against a consumer, like in a normal consumer contract, the case of the Holia and Rambler Moto suggests that uh, it may be necessary for you to show that there has been many, many, many times of dealing before you can, we can say that there's an established cause of dealing uh, between the parties as it were. So let's uh, take note of that. We are going to now discuss the interpretation uh, bit of uh, exemption uh, exclusion clauses, because we, we, we made the point at the beginning that there are two aspects. Anytime you have exclusion or exemption clause, uh, there are two matters. The first one is that has it been incorporated? In other words, does it form part of the contract? That is the first one. And then the second inquiry or the second requirement is that even if it forms part of the contract, if we look at the wording of the exemption clause, if we look at the wording of that exclusion clause, can we say that it actually covers the particular breach? so that it will provide a defense, it will provide an escape route for the other party who is in breach. So we have the first requirement, that is the incorporation. And we have seen that uh, it may be incorporated in one of three ways, either by signature of the parties or by reasonable notice or by course of dealing. Now we want to talk about the second requirement that where exemption clause, exclusion clause has been incorporated and a breach has occurred, the exemption clause, uh, the wedding must actually fit the breach before uh, it can provide uh, protection to whoever was in breach. Hmm. So the traditional approach of the courts uh, to interpretation, we, we discussed interpretation of uh, statutes, uh, then uh, this and other documents uh, last, uh, about, uh, this week, just about three or four days ago uh, in the Ghana legal uh, system class. And some of the things that we said are also applicable here that is with Tandis. So, uh, in terms of the interpretation of contract, traditionally, the approach is a literal one. Uh, literal one means that uh, as Lavelle and Christmas limited against war made the point per a master of the rules at the time, because in Hadi, that quote, it is a duty of the court 
to construe the document according to the ordinary grammatical meaning of the words used therein. So that is the, the what you call the, the, the literal interpretation. Just look at the wording of the document, the content, and you just follow the rules of the gra grammar, what uh, they mean, and that's it. Of course, uh, if you remember the golden rule, we said that where the ordinary grammatical meaning will lead to absurdity and all that, then we need to depart from the, 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 the literal uh, meaning and the, so that we avoid the absurdity. Good. But uh, in recent times, a shift in how uh, the courts interpret a contract. And we can say that there has been a move from the literal approach towards the positive approach of interpretation, uh, with particular emphasis uh, being laid upon the adoption of an interpretation uh, which has regard to commercial purpose of the transaction. So the purposive interpretation is not only in respect of uh, constitutional interpretation or statutory interpretation, but even by and large, uh, in the area of uh, even uh, commercial contract, that the courts uh, gravitate more towards that. And I must say that uh, that is not uh, even uh, new, because if you go to implication of terms, right? Implying terms. If you remember the Mooko case, the Mooko case, what do you call like the, uh, what, the what, what is the word? The, the business efficacy principle, right? That is, uh, if you look at that case, for example, that is an exercise in the uh, purposive uh, uh, construction. Uh, it were. So let's pay uh, note to that. And that was why in the Dutch, uh, Janus Frank uh, against Ben Hope. Lord Sten uh, made the point that, quote, para to the shift during the last two decades from the uh, literal, from the literal purposive uh, approach to uh, construction of statute, uh, there has been a movement from a strict or literal method of construction uh, of commercial contracts an approach for them commercially sensible construction. That is commercially sensible construction. And, and I said that commercial sensible construction is not uh, different from uh, the business efficacy principle we witness in, if you remember, uh, in discussion of them. Now, another rule of interpretation of the exemption or the switching clause is what you call the contra-proferentum rule. Contra-proferentum rule. And what do we mean by the uh, contra-proferentum uh, uh, rule? But the contra-proferentum rule, we, what we mean is that the exemption clause is supposed to be interpreted narrowly or strictly against the party seeking to rely on it. Now remember that we have stated, let me drink my hot water. We have stated that exemption clause is actually seen to be uh, harsh or unfair. And for that matter, the common law uh, set a very straight face against it. And therefore, even where there's evidence of incorporation, when we are interpreting it to find out whether the wedding fits the particular bridge which has occurred, the court will go, will try and avoid expansive interpretation and adopt what they call like the, the narrow, a very strict interpretation. And what do you mean by that? That is to say that when there is ambiguity in the exemption clause, if you say ambiguity, that is to say that, uh, the exemption clause is capable of bearing more than one interpretation. Maybe it can mean three or four things. And if we look at all the possible meanings of that exemption clause, uh, some are harsher to the interest of 
the party seeking to rely on it than the others. So uh, in the midst of the possible competing meanings, that, that is where there's ambiguity. The contract really says that the court should go in for that particular meaning, which will be to the disadvantage, which will hurt the interests of the party seeking to rely on it. So the court will not go for the most beneficial interpretation. The court will opt for the disadvantageous one, that is one of the competing meanings which does not really benefit the party seeking to rely on the exemption clause. Yeah, so that is uh, what uh, we should uh, keep in mind as far as the exemption clause uh, concerned. So therefore, any ambiguity in the exemption clause will be resolved against the party seeking to rely on it. Now the takeaway is that the words used in the exemption clause must be clear and unambiguous. It must cover the liability that has occurred, must cover the breach that has occurred and event of ambiguity, as we have seen, uh, contra preferente require that we have to uh, actually resolve it against parties seeking to rely uh, upon it. And that was why in Andrews Brothers Bournemouth Limited against Singer and Co. Limited, the plaintiff agreed in writing to buy a new sink. The contract contained a clause which excluded the defendant's liability for breach of all conditions, warranties, and liabilities implied by statute, common law or otherwise. The plaintiff car delivered to the plaintiff had in fact done a considerable number of miles. And later on, when the matter came to court, the court took the view that Seller was in breach of an express that the car would be new. You could not therefore rely on an exclusion of implied term and was liable to the plaintiff. So that is why we said that there should be no ambiguity in the exemption uh, clause. And uh, the same thing happened in the case of the uh, Barbary uh, and Mash. And then the, the, the more to a lot of students uh, in Ghana, the whole thing against the Trafalgar Insurance Company Limited. A car insurance policy excluded liability for damage, uh, cost, or arising while the car is conveying any load in excess of that for which it was constructed. At the time of an accident, there were six people in a, with a sitting capacity of five, and the insurance denied liability, claiming that this was a load in excess of that for which the car was constructed. So the, the word uh, load, right, the word load uh, became a source of uh, control versus. Of course, you see some uh, ambiguity in it because load can mean so many. The load can mean just load can mean uh, the human beings that is the passengers, and load can also mean combination of the two and all that. And if you look uh, uh, at insurance policy, it said that uh, if you have an excess load, then the policy will not protect you. When the accident happened, the people in the car, passengers were six, but the sitting capacity of the car is what is five. So uh, when we say load, what is the meaning? If you construe load to mean passengers, then what it means is that you had violated the term of the insurance 
who said that you shouldn't have more than, uh, you know, you shouldn't have SS. And so having six will be SS because the, the capacity of the car is five. But the court applied the contract of rentum rule and held that the word load cases where there was weight, which must not be exceeded as in the case of uh, Loris uh, or Vance, uh, as it were. So let's, uh, and Lord, that's his uh, rumor, for example, uh, stated as follows, that I think that it will be most regrettable if provision of this kind were held to have a force for which the defendants contend, it will be a serious thing involved in a collision. If he were told that the particular circumstances of the accident excluded him from the benefit of the policy, I think that any clause or provision that purpose to have that ought to be clear and unambiguous so that the motorist knows exactly where he stands. This provision is neither clear nor unambiguous. Now, where the was relates to uh, liability for negligence, the court by a three-stage uh, test and is uh, best reflected in the uh, case of Canada Steamship Lines Limited against Al, and where Lord Morton of Harrington made the point that one, if a clause contains language which expressly exempts the party, relying on clause from the consequences of his own negligence, then effect must be given to the clause. That will be what you call like the, a clear uh, case of, uh, if you like, like the disclaimer, right? You remember the case of Hedley Brand against Hela and Partners, for example, where we had like the negligent misstatement, but for the fact that they had incorporated a disclaimer, uh, the court said that uh, they could not be held liable. Had it not been for the disclaimer, they would have been held liable. And that uh, is consistent with the first uh, test, which Lord Mott pointed that if the clause contains a language which expressly exempts the party, relying on the exclusion clause, the consequences of its own negligence, then effect must be given to the clause. And two, if there is no express reference to negligence, the court must consider whether the words used are wide enough in their ordinary meaning to cover liability for negligence. Any doubt must be resolved against the party in breach. Uh, excuse me, let me take uh, this. Hello.
Yeah, okay, yeah. So sorry for the interruption on of this domestic hazards. Yeah, so we're talking about the principle which will guide interpretation of exemption clause liability for negligence. And uh, the second requirement we mentioned was that if there is no reference to negligence, court must consider whether the words rules are wide enough in the ordinary meaning to cover liability for negligence. Any doubt must be resolved against the party in breach. And in fact, before I move on, this is one of the things which makes it even to have a legislation on uh, what we call exemption clauses, including unfair contract terms. For example, how can uh, you enter into a contract with someone and you agree that should the person fail to exercise reasonable due care and you sustain injury and all that, the person should be allowed to go uh, no, just like that without providing any compensation without meeting any liability towards you. So these are some of the things that we need to uh, think about. And then the third, the third requirement is that even if the words used are wide enough to cover the liability for negligence, it must be asked whether the party in breach could be liable on some ground other than that of negligence. If it could be, and if that other ground is not far fanciful or remote, that the party in breach cannot be supposed to have desired protection against it, then it is likely that the words will be taken to refer to the non-negligent liability only. So all that the court is trying to say is that if we are going to uphold exclusion clause or exemption clause or limitation clause with respect to uh, liability for uh, negligence, then we are going to make sure that there's sufficient uh, clarity concerning of the parties. And that is the point about all these uh, three comments that Lord Martin uh, was talking uh, about. But of course, when we talk about like the, the negligence, so don't let us think that it refers only to the technical understanding of negligence as in the existence of duty of care, breach of duty of care, resultant damage and all that. Yes, that could, but not only that. So any uh, neglect, uh, act omission and all that could even pass as a, a negligence for purposes of this type of uh, exemption clause. And not only where you can get the, the threefold uh, test of uh, negligence and uh, general thought of negligence. Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, uh, cases with that. For example, if you look at the case of uh, uh, Monarch Airlines Limited against uh, London uh, Luton Airport Limited, we had like a loose uh, paving blocks uh, which had damaged one of the plaintiff airlines uh, aircraft as it was preparing to take off from the airport. Now, the plaintiff damages for negligence or statutory uh, breach under uh, UK's of Wales Liability Act. And the defendant sought to rely on clause 10 of its standard condition, which excluded liability of the airport, its servants and agent for any damage to aircraft arising or indirectly from any acts, omissions or default, unless done of intent to cause damage and with the knowledge that damage will probably result. So this is what was stated in their condition, standard conditions of carriage. Now the plaintiff submitted that this clause did not cover the liability, which okay, since it did not cover negligence liability. So if you look at the wording of that uh, uh, clause 10, uh, the plaintiff was trying to contend uh, that it could be understood as encapsulating uh, negligence uh, liability. And the court held the clause, that is a clause 10 that uh, we quoted, 
excluded liability for negligence in any breach of statutory duty to own the negligence or breach was caused either with intent to cause damage or recklessly and with knowledge that damage will probably result. And in any event, the words neglect or default were synonymous with uh, negligence. And uh, what I was trying to say that so if we look at what we have over there, uh, they did not use the, 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 the word negligence directly, but there were certain pointers or indicators of that. That is the acts of missing, neglect, or default. So the court's view, those were quite synonymous with, synonymous with negligence. And for that matter, uh, there has been exclusion of liability for negligence. Yeah, similar thing happened in White and John Walker, where you can you can read that. And also the uh yeah, the case of Alsa Crouch Fishing Company Limited against uh, Marvin, which is uh, authority for the proposition that uh exemption clause which totally exclude liability are construed differently from those clauses which merely limit liability. So there are two things. If the you have like a total exemption clause, right? Saying that I'm excluding liability is different from limitation clause because limitation clause only limits liability. It's trying to do capping, try to place a cap that well, I cannot be held liable beyond this. And for that matter, uh, the two are not approached uh, in the same way. And if you look at the Alsa Crouch Fishing Company, uh, Securico had undertaken to provide a security service for the boats, a fishing association. While those vessels were in Aberdeen Harbor, Alsa Crouch were members of that association. One night, their vessel, that is a, a Stratterland, made a mistake, fell and sank. Alsa Crouch claimed 55,000 from Sikariko. Now, Sikariko considered that they had been negligent their contract, but sought to rely upon a clause in the contract restricting their liability to £1,000. And the court was of the view that the limitation clause operated to limit liability to £1,000. And limitation were not to be construed by the exacting standards applicable to exclusion clauses. And since this clause was clear and unambiguous, it was wide enough to cover liability and negligence. In other words, the courts were trying telling us that they are more friendly towards limitation clauses than exclusion clauses. And that is why they're very towards interpretation of exclusion clause such as contra profilentum and all that will not necessarily have to apply to limitation clauses. So let's skip. And that was why Lord uh, Wilberforce uh, made the point in the Alsa Crash case. And I would just like to uh, quote a portion of uh, what uh, he said. Whether a clause limiting liability is effective or not, is a question of construction of that clause in the context of the contract as a whole. If it is to exclude liability for negligence, it must be most clearly and unambiguously expressed. And in such a contract as this, must be construed contra preferentum. I do not think that there is any doubt so far, but I venture to add one further qualification or at least clarification, one must not strive to create ambiguities by strained construction, as I think that the appellants have striven to do. The relevant words must be given, if possible, their natural plain meaning. But this is where I want us to pay attention to. Uh, when he said that uh, clauses of limitation are not regarded by the courts with the same hostility as clauses of what? Exclusion. And why, why is it so? Because they must be related to the other contractual terms, in particular, to the risks to which the defending party may be exposed. 
the remuneration which he receives and possibly the opportunity of the other party to ensure. Yeah, so uh, that is uh, a very useful point uh, for us to uh, notice. What about inconsistent uh, terms uh, found in the exemption? Well, which is all part of like, the interpretation that uh, we are doing that if an exemption clause is inconsistent with another contract or over undertaking, given at or before the time of a contracting, the exemption clause will be overriden by that term or undertaking. And there are a cases to illustrate uh, that. The number of cases to illustrate that. Mm. Now let's uh, quickly talk about uh, the doctrine of a fundamental uh, breach, which often uh, comes up. Well, you might used to be this uh, approach that if you were trying to rely on exemption, but you had failed to perform or carry out the basic purpose of the contract, you could not rely on it. And that is the essence of the fundamental breach that the contract is one thing, the contract has a basic purpose or the fundamental purpose. And if your breach of the contract meant that you fail to perform the basic purpose of the contract, then you cannot uh, take advantage of anything contained in And that was why in the old case of Chanta and Hopkins, Lord Abinja will make the point that quote, if a man buy pairs of another and sends him beans, he does not perform his contract, but that is not a warranty. There's no warranty that he should sell him pairs the contract is to sell pairs, and if he sends him anything else, non-performance of it. So how does fundamental breach uh, operate in relation to exemption clauses? A fundamental breach uh, is a more serious than a breach of a condition or warranty. Although we know that uh, a condition is a term of a major importance and all that, but if we look at the doctrine of a fundamental breach, it goes beyond a breach of a condition or warranty. And for that matter, an exemption clause which protects a party against a breach of a condition or warranty could not shield him the consequences of fundamental breach of the contract. So if for example, you have like an exemption clause, uh, which says that uh, if you are in breach of this condition or this warranty, uh, then you are excluded or your limitation is uh, you know, limited and so um, and your, your liability is limited and all that. If you are accused of being guilty or liable for fundamental breach, the exemption is not uh, protect you or you cannot take advantage of that. So let's look at the, the uh, illustration of the fundamental breach and how it renders exemption clause inoperable uh, by looking at the case of a car sales are limited against Wallace. There, the defendant car owned by Z find it in good order and wish it on high pages. Z does sold it to the plaintiff and they resold it to a high purchase company. The defendant made a contract with this company and the contract contained a term that, quote, no condition or warranty that the vehicle is roadworthy or as to its condition or fitness for any purpose is given by the owner or implied therein. So this was the, uh, the, the, the clause. On attempted delivery, the car, was seen to have changed dramatically to be a virtual wreck incapable of moving. The defendants refused delivery or pay the high purchase installment 
However, the car was towed to his place of business. Now, when sealed, the defendant pleaded the state of the so-called car towed to his business premise. And in reply to this, the plaintiff relied within term, which we have quoted over there, that no condition or warranty that the vehicle is, is roadworthy or as to its condition or fitness for any purpose is given by the owner or implied therein. Now, the court held that there has been a fundamental breach of the contract. There was such a substantial difference between the contract as formed and the contract as performed that the breach went to the root of the contract. The central purpose of the contract was defeated by the breach and the claimant or plaintiff was unable to rely on the switching clause to avoid liability. So the takeaway from car sales hardware limited against Wallace is that uh, where the essential purpose of the contract had been uh, defeated or had not been uh, met, then you cannot rely on exemption clause contained in that uh, contract. Well, as you can see, the courts are hostile towards uh, exclusion clauses, exemption clauses and all that. And all the things that we'll be looking at with respect to the interpretation, the principle of interpretation, are meant to enable the court to provide protection and uh, exemption clause or exclusion uh, clauses. Now, with respect to a fundamental breach, it's the same thing the court is trying to do to provide a way. Uh, the supposed unfairness of exemption clause. Nevertheless, uh, it is pertinent to note that three, uh, I, mean, I mean, two qualifications are there uh, which govern the operation of the doctrine of fundamental breach. That is, how far can fundamental breach uh, render exclusion clause or exemption clause inapplicable? or inoperable. And these are uh, waiver of breach and excluding liability for the uh, breach. So waiver of breach, uh, what do you mean uh, by that? An innocent party may elect to waive fundamental breach and treat the contract as subsisting. Just as when we are discussing a discharge, uh, you know, uh, we talk about uh, uh, we talk about affirmation, like where you are aware of a breach and you behave as if the other party is not in. You have affirmed it, you have ignored it, or you have pardoned uh, the breach as it were. And that was what happened in Hain against the Tate, that the defendant lost their claim because they gave their rights. And so the charter party remained uh, in force. But another way by which you can also uh, go around the principle that fundamental breach can operate to render exemption clause inapplicable is just by you know, construct drafting how you draft it. Draft it in such a way that uh, the exclusion clause would even cover fundamental breach, in which case the court cannot flag fundamental breach so as to render the exclusion clause uh, inapplicable uh, as uh, it were. But before I, I, I leave, uh, there's this particular case I would like you to read. And, 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 and of course, if you look at the uh, point two that I made, Look at the trend of cases now, especially photo production against uh, Securico uh, Transport uh, Limited. Uh, you notice that the UK House of Laws, now the Supreme Court, seem to be saying that the doctrine of fundamental breach is no longer uh, you know, important, but it's more a question of like the construction, right? So as whether 
exemption clause, exclusion clause applicable or not. It's not so much dependent upon whether someone is saying that there has been a fundamental breach and for that matter, you cannot rely on the contract. But more importantly, if you, if you construe, if you interpret the wording of the contract, can we say that having regard to whatever breach that has okay, clause covers it or does not cover it. So please uh, read uh, Photo Production Limited against the uh, Security Pro. Yeah, so very soon. And just before uh, we come back to the law reform uh, uh, drafts people they are using to solicit, I mentioned the fact that if you go to the UK, we know that since 1977, they have the Unfair Contract Terms Act. And what the Unfair Contract Terms Act seeks to do is to uh, try and uh, address some of the challenges inherent in uh, some of the case law regarding exemption clause and some other forms of, con some other aspect of contracting. So at this stage, as I keep telling you, no one knows, but uh, it will not be out of place. Decided to run your eyes, for example, uh, through the UK Unfair Contract Terms Act, especially so the Law Reform Commission is trying to do a similar uh, project in Ghana and see, uh, assuming you have been invited to uh, some ideas concerning what should go into what the Law Reform Commission is trying to suggest for Ghana. I think that would be a useful uh, thing. For but if you look at the, the English uh, legislation on fair contract terms, uh, especially the, the 1977, what is, it, it does is that uh, uh, it applies in the two ways to make a term of contract uh, totally ineffective or to subject it to a test of reasonableness. So there are some terms of contract legislation will say that they are not applicable uh, at all, or they are not uh, accepted to be included in any contract. And for that matter, if they're in the contract, they are considered as a, a being void. And others too, you need to test them against uh, the principle of uh, reasonableness as whether they are reasonable or not before same will be Yes, Francis. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Francis. Um, please, uh, I, I want to um, ask your recommendation for a take home, just um, based on all the expansions you have given us now, in case we are quizzed on uh, sharing any idea to the Law Reform Commission. Uh, what should be the approach or what could be some of the possible recommendations based on what you have just educated us on? And also whether it's possible for you to share your lecture notes with us on, on uh, WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp pages. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm trying to get the, the document retrieved from my email. Yeah, so I will, I, will, I, will, I will send the the material on the platforms uh, to you so that in case you want to run your eyes through them again, you can do that. Is there any other, let me see. Is there any hand up? Uh, okay, no, that was Francis. Uh, just a, a minute, I'm just trying to open a, a document. So while trying to open a document, can somebody uh, 
tell us about the case of photo production against Sikoriko? Yes. Anybody discuss that with us? It's something that you know already. Yes, who will tell us? Photo production against Sikoriko. Okay, Ni. Yeah, Ni. Ni, go ahead. Yeah, so you put up your hand, oh. Okay, that was a mistake on his part. Yeah, ni, na, ni go ahead of uh, release him. Okay, uh, photo production against Kiriko. You know, there was a contract of uh, photo, between photo production and Kiriko. Mm -hmm. And Kiriko put a clause in the contract and excluded themselves from uh, fire and many other things. And this fire came and destroyed the peace and do uh, a sue. And the uh, House of Lord said the, co the construction of the contract and the exclusion clause, you know, exclude photo uh, security from being liable. Okay, thank you. But how, Yanni? Yeah, thank you. So, how did the how did the court react to you called the doctrine of arbitrage? How did the court react to uh -huh. attempt to commit the doctrine of fundamental breach? Well, in fact, I did not read that, but but all I knew is that they were relying on the construction of the exclusion clause by which a uh, photo production read. And to me, up to now, I still believe uh, the court was unfair to me because the way, the way they excluded themselves, openly that they, they don't have any uh, uh, liability for all those exclusions and yet the court ruled for them. Because they were there to do what they are supposed to do for the protection and yet they excluded from the main work that they wanted to do. It's just like uh, uh, in Ghana here, you go to uh, uh, Silver Star and they are telling that if we even use fake, uh, 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 not fake, uh, if we use uh, spare parts that are uh, not working, we, are, we exclude ourselves. That is very, very unfair, but you have no other place to take your vehicle to than Silver Star. So uh, this unfair contract term that uh, is coming, I believe it will help a lot of people because that I think that term in the Silver Star contract is very, very unfair. Right. Yeah, because they have uh, removed uh, commercial law from yeah, the, the examinable areas. Otherwise, the silver, type, silver star type of cases we could have you know, read and discussed them because they are pertinent to uh, what we are doing. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, I can have the document now, I think. Oh, let me download in a second.
Yeah, Tennessee, okay. Uh, so uh, this is um, the discussion. They call it a Ghanaian customary convention that may lead to unfair contract terms. Those are the things that the commission has actually uh, flagged. But the, let's go to the more, uh, okay. Let's get to what they are saying. What we have here is just a response. So we'll just summarize uh, the line. So good. So they have this that uh, respond to the convention. So terms and conditions apply. You know, Ghana, when it comes to most of our transaction, especially watching the news and all that, a lot of that you say that the terms and conditions apply. If we say terms and conditions apply, uh, what does it mean? Can anybody tell us? Then they say that terms and conditions apply. What does it mean? Yes. Anybody? If you say if you see something, say that terms and conditions what apply. What does it mean? Uh, okay, ni, ni, ni. It means, yeah, it means, you see, when they do the advert, uh, when you hear terms and conditions after that is, what they are telling you, if you go to them, will not be exactly what you see. Maybe they will do all the adverts that, oh, uh, if you come, we'll give you, we'll give you a car free and everything. Then it's okay, you, you pay for form. Or oh, certainty. Let me give an example. Okay. I was traveling from uh, 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 one airport in Europe to another, and I went to buy the cheapest tickets. And it was written there, terms and conditions apply. When I got to the boarding gate, I have to pay for my bag, I have to pay for, for my food, I have to pay for even the earpiece that you put on your, on your ear. Okay. Those are the terms. That is with them, but they will not let you know in the adverts. But when you get to exactly where you go to uh, the performance of the contract, then they will come with the terms and conditions that will not uh, 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 give you what you had in the adverts. That's how I understand it. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other? And you see that the term, so will you say that the terms and conditions suggest unfairness or a rough uh, or some deceptive uh, practice towards consumers. Uh, yeah, Nasik. Nasik and then uh, later Joshua. Uh, hello. Yes. No, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, there are, there are the detailed rules that are not basically given out on the face value. So before you agree to the contract, or after agreement to the contract, there will be detailed rules that are applied to fulfilling a particular aspect of it or in generality. So when you are not privy to that, and you take it absolutely that what they are saying on the advert or on the paper you are holding is final, then you may be wrong sometimes. I think that's simply the way I see it. Okay, but before you go, uh, there is what you call like the a gimmick, right? Or mere path okay. and all that. Okay. So should we say that? Yeah, Monio. Yeah, what about oh, please, Joshua? Uh, just sorry, sorry, I'm very sorry. Can, can we say that uh, 
interested in the thing, and then we were just applying. We understood, I guess, like the normal, uh, you know, three paths or game as it were. And the, the, I would say that for the path, it's just a sugar coated where that may not necessarily have a true impact. Hello? Yes, we are listening. Yeah, it may just be something to entice you into the contract, but not necessarily a major ingredient of the contract. For instance, uh, MTN is advertising for shares and say, when you purchase this, this is what you are entitled to. But they go on to say there are terms and conditions apply. So in fulfillment of the contract, there are other detailed aspects of the conditions or the terms, which you must also agree to and in eventually applicable to the entitlement of the contract. Okay. Uh, I think my miss and is up. Yeah, Doc. Yes. Yeah, I want to contribute to, to all that. Yes. Yeah, the terms and conditions are rules, requirements, and provisions which govern an agreement or a contract. So, hello. Yes, you are listening. Yeah, I went to uh, MTN shop to buy a phone, Nokia uh, 2.4. And I've been told terms and conditions apply. I went home with the phone and I observed that the phone developed a fault. It just went blur. When I went to the shop, he told me that in the warranty, uh, the condition is that uh, there was a crack somewhere. So, uh, the terms and conditions apply that when there is any crack on the phone and I bring it, they will not uh, accept it within the six month duration. So I just went home. I, I read it and then I just went home. So they are binding. A, 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 um, it, the, it, is, it binds both parties to whatever you have gone to do at the shop. For instance, uh, the example that I have given with regards to MTA. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So just to uh, wind up on that particular uh, the first issue, terms and conditions apply. Uh, discussion, which has gone on, is that we say that it is really an unfair practice, for which reason uh, there should be a legislation to check that. If you said that, uh, when you are not talking, just mute yourself. Mute yourself when you are not talking. Yeah. So if there was a requirement that sellers or advertisers should spell out all the, uh, you know, the terms and everything, can you imagine how advertisement will really belong? In any case, we know that advertisement especially in the potentially bilateral contract, is not an offer. It's just an invitation to treat. So since the invitation to treat, uh, why should we be worried about, uh, about that? And in terms of uh, control, so we have maybe, when, if it has to do like the food and medicine, we had the Food and Drugs uh, Authority and the uh, Ghana Standards Board, they know that who are supposed to uh, vet uh, some of these claims before they can go into the market. So uh, there's uh, this thinking that is really not uh, necessary for, for us to legislate on this particular aspect, uh, since it does not put the consumer in an unfair uh, position as it were. Then we also have the another, uh, the so-called another Ghanaian convention which is also flagged as being a candidate for uh, this particular law they're trying to make. That goods sold are not returned. Uh, somebody signed this up. Let me see who signed this up. Okay. The goods sold are not uh, returnable. Of course. Barista.
Yeah, good morning, Dad. Thank you. Uh, if I had you right, you mentioned that uh, on the first point of terms and condition apply, that it appears that it does not put a consumer in an unfair position because when it relates to a particular area, there are some authorities there who are already there and are already mandated by law to ensure the consumer protection. But I don't know if that is actually true for all particular areas of commercial activities. Like one of my brothers just made an example to the transport industry where he was traveling and based on their ticket, they also have some of the terms and condition. So is it safe to say that we cannot or we there's no need for legislation on this area because in almost every aspect, there are some authorities there who are already uh, mandated by law to protect for the FDA and the other ones, I agree. But maybe that may not be true for all other areas of commercial activities. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Varisa. All right, I very much uh, understand your point. Uh, Davidson, Jr. Yeah, Doc, um, I think that um, to an extent there is a need for legislation because when when you, you like someone just said, you, you someone, if it's a term and it's going to go to the roots of the contract itself, shouldn't shouldn't we shouldn't we be previewed to, to the to that term before we go into it? You see, so like you said, if it's a mere path, we know it's just advertisement they are do they want to sell but then you conclude by saying that terms and condition apply if they apply will you not shouldn't you give the the customer the opportunity to at least see the term in this 21st century the, the net is all over the place you can say kindly read the terms on maybe our site there should be the opportunity they shouldn't use a, a gimmick to they should there should not be that that snare Let's say somebody comes all the way from uh, uh, north to Accra just because of your advert. Then he comes, you give him a tall paper and in it are full of terms that are going to be used against the person. It means it's some, some kind of a uh, uh, cover up thing that people just do before you realize they've taken advantage of you. So if it's a term and it's going to go to the roots, at least even in those olden days, they tell you that kindly see back or just read the term on our platform, uh, on our platform. Sometimes before you even have a chance to read or anything, they've taken advantage of you and it's not fair. Isn't it the case that what advertisers do is probably out of sync or does not conform to our understanding of the law. Because like you, the law is quite subtle when it comes to uh, offers, invitation to treat and all that. So does it really matter that they'll say that terms and conditions apply? And by saying terms and conditions apply, as some of you have rightly argued, no contract exists in the first place. So what is the point about terms and conditions what apply? Anyway. I mean, these are matters we can continue to debate, but the most important thing is for us to uh, be aware of what we're talking about. Uh, yeah. So another one, goods uh, sold are not uh, returnable. Uh, that's another common practice. You go to a shop and then say the goods sold are returnable. But if you look at the Sale of Goods Act, uh, especially Section 8.3, there's a provision there that uh, provision a contract of sale which is inconsistent with or repugnant to the fundamental obligation of the seller is void to the extent of the inconsistency or repugnance. So like one of the fundamental obligation is the, the fact that fitness, right? Fitness for purpose, like the thing being uh, purchased should be suitable for the purpose uh, for which the, the, the object is uh, really known. And for that matter, if you bought a phone and the phone cannot even ring, cannot make a call, 
And then you have uh, you no know, writing there that goods sold are not retainable. No, if and there was and 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 it was not the case that you could have done like maybe proper examination and the uh, defects who have been so uh, like patent. Well, but even if they, if they are even latent, so that they are even like they're hidden and things like that. It's just unfortunate that uh, there's this uh, confusion from the examinable areas that commercial law is not one of the areas. And for that matter, we are constrained in uh, doing uh, too much of the sale. Otherwise, we could have expressed some more thoughts here. <clears throat> then we also have that the, there's another one. We are not responsible for the safekeeping of your car park here. That's another practice uh, which we see all over. You go to a hotel, you go to a uh, shopping mall, people's uh, corner shops, you see those things over there. We are not responsible for safekeeping of your car park here. What is the meaning? Uh, how does it fit within the context of what we know as far as the exemption or exclusion clauses are? Should we, uh, for example, uh, make a law uh, trying to uh, regulate that. But we have a law, what they call the Hotel uh, Proprietors Act. Uh, Hotel Proprietors Act of uh, 1957. And there's a provision in section 2.3 to the effect that a proprietor of a hotel is not liable for any loss or damage down to a vehicle unless the owner of the vehicle has booked an accommodation with the, with the hotel. So do you think that uh, uh, we should rethink the practice which says that uh, no visitors park if their car there or those practice that we are not responsible for the safekeeping of their car park here? Uh, is this something that we should legislate so that we make some other Yes, you make some other uh, recommendations. Yeah, Francis, I, yes. Yes, please. Um, I think this particular case you just cited is a very good one in the sense that at least there's a clause there that says that unless you have booked a room or accommodation with, which means that um, the moment you park your car in their environment or on their premises, and then you have an accommodation with them, there is a liability on their part if anything happens to your car. But uh, most often than not, we have a total uh, or complete exclusion of liability, where uh, even on, on university campuses or so, you will see uh, that disclaimer that the, the occupier is not liable for whatever happens to your car, irrespective of whether you are a student or you, you have an accommodation with them or whatever which I think is, is, is very unfair to the customer. And it is an advantage that uh, the occupier takes um, of the client or, or, or of the customer. There should be a legislation to at least make the occupier liable. If I am entering your, prom your premises, probably I'm spending the night over or I'm going for lectures and I'm parking my car on your premises, there should be some kind of security for my car. That is my thinking. Okay, but you see, the, the, the other concern is that, let's, let's look at it from the hotels. Or the legislation I mentioned just applies to hotels, but of course, it's not only hotels where we can think about uh, shopping malls, restaurants, and other places. Now, let's suppose that someone has a hotel, and the whole hotel, if, you, if you're having to, the entire set is not even up to, let's say, uh, 500,000 Ghana cities. And somebody brings a very expensive car, and the car is, let's say, about 400,000 Ghana cities, or even 450,000 Ghana cities. And if something were to happen, just one customer's car, right? It can collapse the entire hotel. And again, uh, should we, are we in overbedding? those in charge of premises, not to be only hotel, uh, in terms of uh, safekeeping of things that are you know, 
visitors bring their, especially their cars and things like that? Or should we, uh, yeah, I mean, this, 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 these are matters which are not uh, settled. Yes, we have the lawful uh, uh, invitees, right? People that you have uh, invited on the premises and all that. But if you're invited somewhere to the premises, must you also have a, a full scale responsibility to safeguard the person's uh, valuables? Wouldn't that be putting so much uh, cost on you? If in every small uh, shop, they have a parking lot, they have to get like a security guard and things like that. If we are to really insist that the law should go in that direction, are you not putting too much burden on the on on on, on small businesses and things? Yeah, mommy, mommy, yeah. And then uh, who again? Mommy and Francis, okay. Yeah, Doc. Um, good morning. I am only responding to a comment one gentleman made, I think, few minutes ago, in relation to a student being on a university campus who has a car. But however, the university will not be liable for whatever damages that will be caused to the car. I am of the opinion that the university may be right because the contract between the student and the university is that of tuition, not um, what is being considered as a luxury. Cars are not necessities. They are luxuries that just add up to you, the student, wanting to be comfortable. So therefore, the school cannot take responsibility for whatever happens to your car on campus. It is what happens to you, the student, your security, that the school should be bothered about. If the school fails in providing you tuition or whatsoever, that is when the school might have failed and then will be liable for any action that the students would want to take, but not the addendums the students wants to create for his or her comfortability. Thank you. Right. Okay. Very well noted. Okay, so you can keep uh, thinking about this, but, but let's flag the the uh, last but one or two issues, and then we uh, we end the class for the morning. I have some meetings, so attend. So we have the illiterate uh, another another area. Another area we have is the illiterate parties uh, 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 contract. So that is uh, another. Uh, thing that uh, we need to think about. We have the illiterate protection uh, ordinance. And yes, that is a very useful legislation. It used to be very you know, helpful going back to, uh, what is it, the period in which it was made, as far back as the, uh, the 1912. And if you remember the old case, remember the old case of uh, uh, Kwame and Kofu, which went all the way to the Privy Council, where they said that there is no presumption that uh, an illiterate uh, Ashanti who has appended his uh, in a thumbprint or something on a document without the jurat uh, can be taken to understand what he or she has done and things like that. So that legislation uh, was good at the time that it was made, but isn't it in a need for a reform? especially if we look at the cases like uh, Zamrama and Zebedi, right? And things like that, uh, where that's his Pega and co, uh, make the point that if an illiterate is a party, is a, a, to a, a documentary transaction, uh, the mere fact that there is no jurat on the it is not conclusive of the fact that he or she cannot be bound by the document. If you can get some other evidence, if you can get some other evidence by which we can show that that person uh, knew or understood uh, what the document that he or she had put his uh, signature there was saying, that he can be uh, held uh, bound by it. Uh, so, and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, if you look at the, the uh, the, the, the practicality of it. A lot of areas where uh, illit illiteracy may be a problem and those who are illiterate do not appear to have significant protection by the law. Let's take most of the, these uh, data, uh, you know stuff. Mobile money uh, transaction, but of course then the argument uh, would be that if you are illiterate, uh, how are you able to uh, protect uh, those uh, gadgets? Or what about like the ATM? 
Well, we have an ATM. Uh, some ATM, they have like the, the sound and you don't need to read at you can use like the, the sound prompting. But no, we don't have uh, those ATMs in Ghana, but they are, they are there. You can use like the sound uh, prompting to uh, communicate and, and do what you Or you think that uh, as far as illiteracy is concerned, there is no need any uh, rethinking of the position of our law so as to ensure more fairness and protection for weaker parties or protection for illiterates when it comes to contractual transaction. What do you think? Any thoughts? Would you like to see the law improve? I mean, as far as uh, illiterates are concerned when it comes to transactions and, yes, Francis. Yes, please. And the understanding I have from uh, some of those judicial pronouncements, such as uh, Kwame Nkufu, uh, Rita Reed, and Atisho Bay, is that uh, illiteracy is kind of a disability. And so it's being a disability which actually puts the uh, illiterate or the semi-illiterate in a disadvantaged uh, position when it comes to uh, contra uh, contracting. There should then be, besides the judicial pronouncement, it will, it will only be feasible and tried for there to be some uh, a law that will protect the interests of illiterates. So then at least the illiterate also being aware of such a, a legislation, they will know what their rights under such a, a legislation will be and what uh, 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 what remedies they can seek in case of uh, a breach. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Francis. Okay, so you can be thinking about some of these matters. Then uh, another thing which the Law Reform Commission has also flagged is what we call the Small or tiny or hidden exemption clauses. Small or tiny or hidden exemption clauses. And uh, if you go to places like the, the VIP or the GPLTU protest, uh, the practice is quite uh, common uh, over there. They will have tiny you know, exemption clauses written either the ticket or uh, the, the terminal, or you go to me like the SCC, SCC too, they, 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 they have that. And question is, is it practical? Do we expect, do we expect uh, customers to be taken to have been aware of those exemptions because they are there, regardless of the, the character the, or the, the apparent attempt to either conceal them and not make them uh, obvious. Of course, we know that the common law is quite clear that where the exemption clause doesn't require signature, reasonable notice be given. And I think that uh, this is an area where the common law is clear and we can test the Propriety of the practice we have in Ghana here against the settled common law. And I don't think there is any need for uh, changing the law because the law is quite certain. Mami, uh, Mami want to say something. Yes, Doc, um, I am taking us back to the illiteracy. I think um, under this, we need to establish who an illiterate is. I think um, there's been um, a general misconception that an illiterate is somebody who is unlettered. But however, um, it goes beyond that. Assuming this lecture is being transmitted in English and then I only speak French, under that circumstance, I am an illiterate. Right. I right. am wondering if that is the case. So then we are able to establish where illiteracy sets in and then um, the remedies or otherwise available for the person. Because if we are thinking it's just an unlettered person and then I come in and then there is a notice which is in English and then I'm unable to read your English because I can just read French. And then somebody somewhere thinks 
I can read and write. And that does not make me, or I don't qualify to be an illiterate. So I, I just want us to establish who an illiterate is so that from there, you can at least know where and when to take a path. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, Mami. Uh, and in Ghana, we have uh, official language. English is the official language. If you are doing a transaction and you are using the official language, let's say the English, then to all intent and purpose, if someone cannot read and write the English, if the person can read and write three or a way or house that is so illiterate as far as the, the particular language you are dealing with is concerned. So I think it will come back to uh, the language, just like the, the, GIA, uh, the, the German passenger case that we saw. The uh, person could speak only uh, Germany and write German and not uh, English. And the court was of the view that the person was like the, an illiterate and needed protection by the law. Yeah, so uh, Mame, uh, you are quite right. Depends so much upon uh, how you define uh, illiteracy. That, 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 that is true. Now, finally, uh, the Afonso flag, uh, what we call the unequal bargaining power, that in Ghana, if we look at the number of transactions, and you can obviously see that uh, the parties are not dealing with arm's length when it comes to uh, no loan arrangement at banks and all that. But I think that it's an area that uh, there's no need for legislation because the law is quite settled. We know uh, what the position of the law is when it comes to the rest and the influence, unconscionability and all that. So there's no need to actually legislate on this particular area. Okay, so this will mark the end of uh, this uh, session of our discussion. So later on uh, in the day, we will continue with some uh, discussion of the past questions that we have been doing. So have a very good day.